Hi guys, it's Tom from Comic Book Creature. I'm wearing my glasses right now. I was getting ready for bed and I got some really bad news. A dear friend of mine by the name of John Stone, he passed away yesterday and I just discovered this on Facebook. John Stone was really important to me because he was the comic book shop owner of really my first comic book store that I used to frequent. He always had a smile. Uh, he was always such a really good guy. Uh, he had a wonderful heart. Uh, bought many, 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 many comics from the man over the years, and uh, he was just one of those special people. Uh, he was a good guy, and I have a feeling I know where he is, so I'll look forward to seeing him again one day. Uh, when something like that happens, it makes you feel kind of um, nostalgia. It makes you feel sad. Uh, He'd been battling being sick for quite a while. He was in the comic book industry selling books for, I guess, close to 30 years. And he was one of the best. His uh, shop was in Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, near the campus of East Tennessee State University. And it was called Mountain Empire Comics. He and two of his best friends uh, opened comic book shops, uh, one in Bristol, one in Kingsport, and one in Johnson City. Some of you watching this video may have actually went through the door of one of those stores. But um, Howler Mouse had um, put out a request for a video to tell stories about our favorite books, some of our favorite books, and I thought it'd be pretty fitting to start with uh, telling you a little bit about my friend John and sharing that with you because there's a lot of books in my collection that I bought from him and he was just one super guy. Rest in peace, John. So, um, I'm in my glasses, so please excuse any glare. So I'm gonna start with this first book over here. This is a book that was my dad's, uh, and it's uh, the Classics Illustrated, The Jungle Book. And I remember reading this book, uh, it was in his drawer, and I seem to always gravitate toward it and a Spider-Man that I've showed in another video. Because inside this book, there was adventures of a, a little boy who was in the jungle, uh, and he encountered everything from bears to uh, black panthers to snakes. And as a kid, I just wanted to be that kid uh, out in the jungle. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I really, really enjoy the Tarzan and Kazar and uh, stuff like that. And the sword and sorcery were the, it's more of a, simpler type of existence, uh, but one that's close to nature. And this Classics Illustrated uh, was one of my very first reads as a kid. It was my dad's, and I enjoyed the art in it, and I enjoyed the story, and it was just a fantastic, um, fantastic book that I kept returning to over and over again. Somehow it's managed to stay in pretty good shape over the years, and I'm really glad to have it in my collection now. So that's the Classics Illustrated Jungle Book. And that's my first storybook. Uh, the second book is something I wanted to kind of talk about. It's actually three books. It's a limited series. Uh, it's the Babylon 5 limited series uh, in Valen's name. And there's the first issue. And the second issue. Uh, it's one of my favorite all-time covers. Hopefully that's not glaring too bad. And then the third issue. Now the story that goes with this book, this series rather, it more focuses on the television show. If you've not seen the television show Babylon 5, you really need to do so. And kind of the story that goes with this is that a group of friends um, and I would get together and we would watch Babylon 5 every week. I mean religiously. We ate, slept, and breathed this show. It was just the greatest thing ever. There are so many shows out there today that owe so much to Babylon 5. Uh, it began to bring back the tendency to have a serialized uh, story where it was like watching a giant novel and the character development was just so magnificent and, and just fantastic storytelling. To be honest with you, uh, second, third, fourth season of Babylon 5 probably has some of the finest moments that have ever been placed on television. 
Certainly now those special effects are a little bit dated, but the acting and the plot and the way that it's, the show's put together is still wonderful. If you have not seen Babylon 5 and you like good TV, uh, science fiction, great characters, you really owe it to yourself to watch it in order. In order. It's one of the most fantastic things I've ever seen. Um, shows today like Walking Dead and uh, Fear the Walking Dead and um, other shows that tell a serialized story owe a tremendous debt to Babylon 5. Uh, in recent, the recent past, the new Battlestar Galactica, which was also an excellent show, picked up on this serialized um, way of telling a story of one episode leading into another and episodes way down the line referring to early episodes. It's become popular in television, and Babylon 5 is one of the pioneers of that um, for TV. Frankly, when it first came out, people tried to say that Babylon 5 was a copy of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which is also an excellent show. But what truly was happening there is, at first, it might have been copying it just a little bit. But finally, when Babylon 5 and J. Michael Stravinsky's writing took hold of that show, uh, it became something that Deep Space Nine began to emulate. So instead of Babylon 5 copying Star Trek, Star Trek began to copy Babylon 5. And Deep Space Nine, as a result, became a fantastic show. Uh, the format was just wonderful. And so that's the story that goes with that set of comics. Uh, if you haven't seen Babylon 5, you just need to do it. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, this third story comic that I have is something that a lot of you may not have ever seen before. This is Crimson Plague, number one by George Perez. Okay, what's special about this book to me is that um, another dear friend of mine uh, by the name of Tim Chandler, uh, who also used to go to John's uh, shop, he is uh, actually in this book. I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to show you the panel. Tim got to know George a little bit over, over the years, going to different conventions. And at one point, when George was going to put out his own, his own series, this Crimson Plague, he told Tim, I'm not sure exactly how Tim ended up in the book, but uh, he told Tim that he was going to put him in it. And so I have to find the panel and show you my friend, Tim Chandler. Uh, is in this book. I apologize for having to search for it. I had it marked earlier, but wasn't expecting to do this video tonight. So I'll find it in just a second. Okay. Don't know if you can see it right there, but there is Tim. Okay. I'm going to try to get it a little closer. The camera might need to be moved and brought up to see it. a guy with a mustache and glasses. And that's my old college buddy, Tim Chandler, who ended up being drawn in this book. And it even mentions him by name in here. Uh, it says the ship's morale has improved quite a bit. Real team spirit. Even Chandler seems to have warmed up to Lieutenant Blass, sharing the helm with him. And you know, how possessive Tim usually is about that pilot chair. So Tim is actually the pilot of the ship in Crimson Plague. Uh, Tim and I spent a lot of hours talking when we were both at the same uh, in the same dorm at East Tennessee State University. So it's kind of cool to have one of your best pals in a comic book. And that's a, a very special story to me because of that. Uh, this, little, um, this next comic is something that uh, has a, a pretty cool story. This is one of those series that, as far as financially, it's absolutely worthless, uh, but it is one of the best memories of my childhood ever. Uh, one of the reasons that I, I even picked this book up is because it was called Blue Devil. When I was in elementary school, if you call it junior high now, it was a K-8, uh, our mascot was the Newmansville Blue Devils. And so when I saw this on the shelf, I had to have it. Well, it's the story of uh, Dan Cassidy, who is a stuntman in Hollywood, who gets hit by a blast of supernatural energy of a, from a demon-like creature that invaded the set and gets fused into his stunt costume permanently. Um, this series was pretty short. It ran for 
20 odd issues. And if you read it ever, and I really recommend you do, it probably uh, might not hold up as well as it did back then, but it has some hilarious moments. One of my favorite moments in it is when Blue Devil is, dry, is uh, driving a small car and uh, he <laughs> loses control of the car and he starts skidding all over the road. So he knocks both windows out with his large arms and he tries to brake so hard he shoves his feet through the floorboard and he's scooting along in this car, tearing it all to pieces, trying to stop it. And I remember the line where he screams out, oh, come on, it worked for Fred Flintstone. And I remember as a kid just thinking that was hilarious. Um, it is really a good, fun series. So that's uh, Blue Devil number one. This last book is super special to me. This is Batman uh, number 430. It's nothing special. There's no special appearance by a supervillain of any type that has any recognition. There's, it's not famous uh, for its authorship. It's not famous for the artist that drew it. Uh, nothing like that. It's kind of a simple cover. But to me, this is the comic book that defines what Batman is. So let me explain what I mean by that. In this story, Batman is called out just to deal with the normal, everyday bad guy. And recent stuff and news makes us really think about this, but it, it, when this came out, we really weren't thinking about it that much. This guy, the bad guy in this story is a shooter who climbs up to the top of a building and he starts shooting people. Well, the police come, and of course, Batman gets involved, and he's, he ends up fighting with the guy a little bit, and it's a very powerful story. The thing that makes it so interesting is that as the bad guy starts to back away from Batman, getting toward the edge of the building, Batman knows that the police and the snipers that work for them are going to take him out if he gets too close to the edge. So he does everything in his power to try and stop him. Well, he gets shot anyway, and the man falls to his death. And then Batman uh, walks to the edge and is looking down over the scene. And I'm going to post a picture of those final two pages at the end of this video. It's extremely powerful, and it shows you just really what the story of Batman truly is that character and what his morals and his code really is. And it's one of the most impressive Batman tales that nobody's read. And I highly recommend it. It's just really moving and really well put together. It's why I like Batman so much. He's so uh, believable, especially in moments like this. I'm also going to put a link uh, at the end of this um, video in the below down here for you. It is going to be a link to another YouTube video that will showcase John and his comic shop. Please go watch it. Um, you'll kind of get a feel for the kind of guy John was and the kind of great shop that he had. And uh, he will be missed terribly. Thank you all for watching. Be kind to each other. Have a good night.